Whistleblowing is a form of civil disobedience. The NSA is trying to vacuum up as much of the internet as possible. If you can find a way to block that attack, we'll give you an extra $50,000. We need to be ready. People are going to try and exploit it. People always try to exploit something new, right? I know how viruses work. I know how they can get in. I just don't open that door. Even if they put a you know, wet washcloth over my face and told me we need you to give up the source, I couldn't do it. Hey everybody, welcome to the Engadget Show for the month of August. I'm Brian here, joined by Terrence O'Brien. And uh, we're here on Wall Street, and do you kind of feel like somebody's watching you? Yeah, we're actually here to talk about security and surveillance, and we've come to one of the number one destinations in New York to get your pockets picked. Yeah. Going to kick things off with an interview with John McAfee. He's, uh, he's fresh off a of vacation in Belize. I hear it was a very relaxing time. He had a good time, made it back home safe though. That's true, he's back in the States. Uh, he's making internet videos now. I don't know if you had a chance to check out uh, How to Uninstall McAfee Antivirus. I, I did, I think it's gotta be one of my top five films of all time, Citizen Kane of YouTube, I think. Good news, Citizen Kane 2 is about to come out. We went behind the scenes at his most recent YouTube video shoot and um, gotta say, probably the weirdest segment in the history of the Engadget Show. I'm very excited about it. Let's go get a churro. Okay. My name is John McAfee. I'm the founder of the McAfee Antivirus Software Company. Many of you may know me from my past careers as international fugitive, collector of young women, one time yoga master, and antivirus guru. What I do is what I want, basically. If you can't have fun doing what you're doing, then do something else. I've always done that. When I started McAfee, I had fun. And when I stopped having fun, I quit. I've had nothing to do with McAfee software for over 15 years. I've had more pressing things to do. I'm, I'm bored with software. I'm bored with computers. The Urban Dictionary definition for McAfee. McAfee, a barely passable virus scanning program that updates at the worst possible times. Tends to render your computer completely useless whenever it starts an update, which it doesn't ask to start, and you cannot cancel or pause. Every antivirus piece of software consumes resources and time. Uh, it's the price you pay for a, a sense of security. I don't use any antivirus software and never have. I have yet to have a virus. I'm being very honest with you. I just uh, I try to avoid doing things that uh, would, um, would give me a virus. You know, if I get email from someone I don't know, it goes into the trash. I know how viruses work. I know how they can get in. I just don't open that door. As long as people have the, the urge to mess with you, you're going to have problems. Whether or not it's a tagger that wants to uh, tag the, uh, the building that's just been painted, uh, or someone trying to bring down the Pentagon. This is just the nature of reality, the nature of life. The premise of the first video was actually multifold. Number one, I have to point out the fact that, you know, look, it, please don't hang me for writing that software because I've had nothing to do with it for a long time. Although I've had nothing to do with this company for over 15 years, I still get volumes of mail asking, how do I uninstall this software? I have no idea. Uh, the second, I took the opportunity just to make fun of all the labels that the press has, has labeled me. Paranoid, so I did that paranoid rant. I mean, it's always there, it's watching. It's been watching me for years. You know, surround myself with, with women and guns, so I surrounded myself with women and guns. A user of bath salts, which seriously, I, I have enough money even still to buy good drugs if I wanted to do drugs. So why would I be doing bath salts for heaven's sakes? You know, the, the worst drug in the planet. And over half of the emails that I've received since the first email were, "Damn, you're a badass. Keep this up." So I go, "Okay, well I'll do it. I'll do one on badasses, and why not? I give people what they want." Since I became a badass, my world has changed. Being exiled itself doesn't teach you much. I mean, it's just getting thrown on an airplane and landing in another country. But the, uh, the month and a half that I spent evading the authorities and, and running underground taught me a great deal. It's not the first time I've done that. Back in the 70s, I was not a small-time drug dealer and spent a lot of time evading authorities in Mexico and, and Central America. 
So it's nothing new to me. The thing that it taught me is that you have to know what you're doing when you're doing it. You have to understand the culture that you're in. I think the mistake that Snowden made was, why didn't he stay in Hong Kong? I would love to be in Hong Kong if people were after me. You know, I'd get myself a tank top and just fade into the back alleys and start a new life. Because he's going to have to start a new life somewhere. Uh, going to Russia, whoa, who advised him to do that? Seriously. So, I've had to do what I have to do best, help other people. I've now started the Magdalene School for Bad Houses. That was good. Right, coming up next, we're heading to San Francisco to visit with the EFF, it's the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Whoa. Just dropped a little knowledge bomb in your head. Uh, also went to San Diego to speak to Cory Doctorow, uh, talked to Bruce Schneier, some top thinkers in the world of uh, security. Yeah, and we also uh, swung by the New Yorker to talk about their software called Strongbox, lets people anonymously send them leaks and tips and information. Yeah, so stay secure out there. I know you're watching, Verizon. My name is Trevor Tim. I'm a digital rights analyst at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. We focus on all sorts of internet law from free speech to privacy to copyright and fair use and basically we fight for the user. We're doing a lot on NSA surveillance programs, domestic drones, also all sorts of free speech and transparency issues. The NSA revelations didn't really surprise us. We've been actually been suing over this for about six years now. These are a lot of the same revelations that came out in 2005 and 2006 under Bush's warrantless wiretapping program. The only difference here is the FISA court, uh, the secret court that, that issues surveillance orders, is now basically sanctioning what the Obama administration is doing before George Bush was just bypassing the court altogether. The FISA Amendments Act uh, lets the government issue these broad surveillance orders to these companies, which they're forced to comply with. Yahoo, back in 2008, tried to secretly fight these in court. Uh, they unfortunately lost, so started complying. Twitter tells their users if they received a surveillance order. They were even reported to be the only holdout of the major companies in the secret PRISM surveillance program. Edward Snowden is a hero. Total hero, model for the future of activism, right? Whistleblowing is a form of civil disobedience. I'm Cory Doctorow. I write science fiction novels, and I'm one of the editors and owners of Boing Boy. And I'm a journalist, and I'm an activist, and a fellow of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. We've had telescopes for a long time, but it's not inevitable that we'd all become peeping toms. We had a social contract about telescopes, right? People who, people who look through telescopes through their neighbor's windows are creeps, right? If, I, if you find out that your friend watches the neighbors through a telescope, you shun your friend, right? The reason we have a surveillance state is not because surveillance is inevitable when you have computers, it's because spooks have no adult supervision, right? They, they, they have uh, subscribed to the greater haystack theory of terrorism prevention, which is to say that if you've got a small haystack with some needles in it uh, of terrorism that you can't find, the thing to do to make those needles e easier to find is to make the haystack bigger on the grounds that more needles will somehow magically appear. You know, gathering information without any particularized suspicion in enormous mountains will somehow make terrorism uh, uh, more, more visible to you. And it's, it's, a, it's a, a nonsense, right? It's, it's nonsense on stilts. The NSA is trying to vacuum up as much of the internet as possible and right now they're building a facility in Utah which is going to be basically the biggest data storage facility ever built. This database probably has everybody's phone record from 2006 onward. You know, it's a question of, of how effective this even is, you know. If they're looking for a needle in a haystack, why add tons of more hay? It's pretty much impossible that all of the cell phone data of everybody in the United States is relevant to any investigation. It's pretty much impossible. I'm Bruce Schneier. I basically work in the intersection of security, technology, and people. What they're looking for, we don't know. Is it able to find terrorist plots? Almost certainly it's not. People who study big data, I mean, say this, there's, there's just too much data 
false positives kill you. There is no security. There's only security in a context. So am I anonymous in relationship to the people walking their dog over there? Yes. Am I anonymous in relationship to the phone company who can track my SIM as it moves from tower to tower and my Emmy in case I swap SIMs? No. I think it's really scary for people, uh, especially innocent people who uh, have no reason to believe that they've done anything wrong and yet the government has all this information. When you look at some of the stuff the NSA is doing now, they're bypassing the cryptography. Now, you have an encrypted channel between you and your Gmail account, right? It uses uh, SSL. But if the NSA can go into Google and say, give me the email, it doesn't matter if it's encrypted. We can encrypt things so that nobody can decrypt them, period. I mean, that, that you know, computers the size of planets and millions of years, we can throw out all those big numbers. But as soon as you start building actual systems, software on computers, on networks used by people, suddenly the math becomes just a small part of overall security. And there are many, many ways to break into a system. I have full disk encryption on a Linux box that I carry around in my bag. So if I lose the machine, uh, the data is uh, proof against anyone except a state level actor. I have an encrypted backup drive that I travel with and another one on my desk. So that's my personal data strategy. You know, you can download Tor, which is an anonymizer. So it basically hides your location of where your computer is. OTR chat capabilities stands for off the record. It encrypts your chats so that the services can't actually see what you're saying. You can also download uh, email encryption tools like uh, PGP encryption, which stands for pretty good privacy. These tools are still fairly hard to use, but if you can master them and get your friends to master them, it does provide a way to, to talk securely online. PGP is still way too hard to use for civilians. I won't pretend it's not. It's worth the time you invest, but it, it's, that's, that's a couple hours that like everybody's like, well, I could be watching Doctor Who. If we spend as much time figuring out the UI for PGP, like as much human hours as we did for Farmville, we would have totally wicked email security by default everywhere. Most cloud services are more secure because the people who run them do a better job than the users at security. But we're not talking about security against attackers. I mean, there's a great reason why you do this, performance, convenience. I mean, we love Gmail. But you're still trusting Google with your mail. And Google can give a copy to the government. Right? You can't stop them. The best and simplest thing people can do if they're looking to help solve this NSA surveillance problem is call their representative. Uh, there are half a dozen bills in Congress right now that need supporters, and the only way uh, representatives are going to start supporting them is if they hear from their constituents that they really care about this issue and that their, that their job in Congress actually depends on it. Congress definitely has the power to set up these courts, and it's definitely in their power to rein them in. You can throw away your computer and your cell phone, but good luck. I'm Nicholas Thompson. I'm the editor of NewYorker.com. So we invented a thing called Strongbox. And the idea of Strongbox is to create a secure way for sources or for anybody to communicate with us without there being any way of anybody being able to figure out where that person came from or how they reached out to us. So people can talk to journalists without having to risk their lives or we'll be able to get out documents, we'll be able to expose corruption, we'll be able to you know, be whistleblowers. So the way it works is this. I'm, I'm a source, I'm a person, or I'm somebody. I want to get information to the New Yorker. So I say, okay, I can log on through Tor. So Tor is an identity protection system. The document is PGP encrypted, so it's hard, even if somebody were to find it, to figure out what's in the document. Then it comes to us. We take it, and we take a little hard drive, and we plug it into a computer, we put the document onto our hard drive where it's still encrypted. Then we go to a second computer, the second computer is not connected to the internet and it doesn't have a hard drive itself and we put in the little thumb drive and then we finally decrypt it. So by the time we decrypt the document and see what it is, it's traveled securely, entirely encrypted, to something that has an air break from the internet and you've been protected through Tor. Meanwhile, they also built a whole lot of code to protect the, protect the system, protect the integrity of it and make it harder for people to hack in. But it means that if somebody were to come to us and say, hey, that document you have, we really want to find out where it came from, we would just say, we have no idea and there's no way we could figure it out. 
The strong box is two things. One, it's a one-way channel. Somebody can send us a document, walk away. We'll have no way of ever finding them. We'll have no mechanism for finding them. But they also, if they want to engage, they can send us a message and say, hey, I want to hear back from you. And then we'll write back to them. We won't have a direct email address or anything. We'll just put a little message on a bulletin board. They, through a secret password that only they have, will be able to read it. So there will be some mechanism for two-way communication. Again, even if they engage in that, we won't have any way of figuring out who they are unless they tell us. We can say, look, our journalists will go to jail protecting your identity. We won't give up information that will reveal your identity. But still, the government has all kinds of powerful tools of coercion. The best thing we can say is, we couldn't even find you if we wanted to. So they can't get your information from us. Even if they put a you know, wet washcloth over my face and told me that you, you know, we need you to give up the source, I couldn't do it. We do know the identity of a lot of leakers. And there is something to be said for learning their identities. It makes it seem a little more real. We can understand where their passion came from. We can understand why they wanted to talk about these things. I edited stories by you know, Ryan Lizzle, political reporter, all kinds of secret documents that he acquired, that were given to him, that he found out. You know, there's a long, long history of um, investigative reporting here that has relied on documents. Jane Mary has used it a whole bunch in the exposure of abuses in the secret detainee program. There are a lot of reporters. Cy Hirsch absolutely has spoken all kinds of things throughout his career. So there are a number of people here who rely on secret documents, who rely on sources, who trust that their um, contributions will be kept anonymous, and this is another mechanism for communication. The system is open source. The code that went into it is entirely open source. Anybody else can build it. They have to download the code. They have to buy some old laptops. They have to buy some thumb drives. I mean, the desires of the people who built it was that you know, this would start at the New Yorker, but then it would spread places. So we're going to do what we can to continue to let people know that this is out there. So I think we can both agree that in the past, fictional depictions of computer security and hacking tad on the absurd side. I mean, Hackers is one of my top five films of all time, but for argument's sake, I'm going to give you this one, Terrence. Well, Ubisoft has a new game coming out. It's called Watch Dogs, and they've worked very closely with the Russian security firm called Kukursky to make sure that the game is as realistic as possible. Sure, you could take all of those hacking skills that you've, you've learned playing video games, and you can use them to break into Microsoft's different software systems, and maybe a little of cash on the side. Are you considering a career switch? Let's talk when the camera's off. Okay. Underway for the suspected vigilante Aiden Pierce. Engaged in several bold interventions, Pierce has divided the city with locals praising his actions. State your emergency, please. Hey, I'm, I'm free. Lose it. Watch Dogs is about a guy named Aiden Pierce. He's a modern-day vigilante who uh, made some mistakes in his past, and those mistakes uh, bit him in the ass, hurt his family, and now he's out to find out who hurt his family, and he wants to protect his family and make sure it never happens again. My name is Kevin Short. I'm the lead story designer on Watch Dogs, and I've been on the project for since the beginning, about five years. Right at the beginning, uh, during conception, we very quickly decided that we wanted something new. We wanted new game dynamics for, for players, and that became, let's make a city that players can control. And the way you control it, that quickly became hacking. And then, of course, we all had our cell phones, and we realized, well, that's the tool, that's the thing we're going to use because cell phones are everywhere, they're an inconspicuous weapon and out of that all our ideas grew. Watchdog is very special in the sense that every entertainment uh, project is based on using a fantasy. Watchdog has this very peculiar thing is that this fantasy is reality. We are showcasing a reality people don't see usually or choose not to see because we all know the the risks of using phones and being connected and having accounts and everything, but we decide not to be too cautious or not to be too worried about it. My name is Thomas Jeffro. I'm dealing with the uh, authenticity of the content and also consistency of the universe. The, the one thing we really wanted to make sure was that anything that we say you can hack in our game is not a magic power, it's not a superpower. It's grounded in some sort of reality. We've, we've found research that says, okay, this is possible. At the time when we started, some of them felt a bit near future. You know, they, they were theoretically possible, but we hadn't really seen them. We did a hell of a lot of research <laughs> on hacking. Uh, we knew rudimentary stuff like everybody, but we started looking into just 
all the types of hacks that are out there that we didn't even know existed. Basically, the, uh, the security and hacking community is a very open one, so there is a lot of information you can get if you look a little into it. And then we also reached out to some uh, uh, pros in the field, uh, one of those being Kaspersky Labs. What we ended up doing was sort of showed them our game design ideas and then uh, we sent them the full script. And basically we had uh, an, an incredible feedback from them. Uh, most of their analysts are gamers also, so they were thrilled to work with us. And they just wanted to help us get some of the language right and, so, and make sure that the tone is right and that it's being as true as possible, while also being a game that's going to be fun and exciting for players to play. When we first started this project, we zeroed in quickly on Chicago because we realized Chicago is the kind of city that would embrace uh, you know, a, a new idea like CTOS. CTOS stands for Central Operating System. It's basically a smart system. So everything in the city, the electricity grid, water, communications, it's all centralized and uh, controlled uh, through one major system. And what that does is it makes uh, commutes for citizens a lot faster. All the traffic lights are perfectly synchronized. Uh, hydro bills, all that sort of thing, are, uh, they pay less. Uh, and communications are a lot quicker. It has a system where uh, the police can anticipate where crimes may or may not happen, uh, which is great for the citizens, great for the cops, because they don't have to have as many people on the, uh, on the streets. They can just re react much quicker. It's also great for somebody like Aiden Pierce, who can hack into this system and uh, take advantage of that. I think smart cities are coming. I think they're, they're definitely coming, and you know, we need to be ready. People are going to try and exploit it. People always try to exploit something new, right? And we should embrace this approach of smart cities, but as we showcase, we have to be thinking about what it means also and how we can prevent anything bad from happening with those great systems. It's important to feel secure because uh, the concept of the Maslow Pyramid uh, puts security at the bottom of it. Basically, it's a basic need. You have to feel secure to be okay and to live a fulfilling life. The biggest thing we want out of this is we want players to finish the game and have a dialogue about what's going on. Because it's not really our place to say whether tech is good or bad, whether uh, uh, smart cities are, are right or wrong, but really it's something that, that we think it's important to discuss it, to talk about it, because we're moving fast. Technology is moving so fast, and it's worthwhile for us to kind of slow down and go, ho, 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 okay, what do we think about this? You know, what are the repercussions of this? Um, am I as secure as I should be? Who watched the watchdogs? I mean, who is watching those guys? Who, who will make sure that it's used right? We can't go back. We can't suddenly, okay, let's unplug everything and, 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 and hide in, in caves. That's our world, that's what we live in, so we just have to be smart about it and uh, put up the best protection that we can. Everybody's got phones, phones, phones. Everybody's got phones, phones, phones. Everybody's got phones, phones, phones. Everybody's got phones, 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 phones. Everybody's got phones. I'm sick of my phone. I love my phone. I tried to make all those hippie packs with myself, like, I'm not going to look at my smartphone when I'm at dinner with my friends. I'm going to restrict myself from using my smartphone because I want to be a, a living, breathing human being, citizen of the world, who talks to real live people and doesn't just stare at his gizmo. But I have violated all my own packs. I don't care anymore. I have no personal integrity. If I'm stopped at a red light, I will use that time to look at Twitter. And that is not, a, that is not an expansive amount of time sitting at a red light. That isn't an, uh, that is not a period of time that I used to, to rue the waste of. I did not used to sit at stoplights and go, God, I could be doing something. I would just sit there. Not now. I literally look at my smartphone while my infant daughter is begging me for food. I feel like I can do both things. I can feed her and raise her well, 
and be looking at my smartphone the whole time? I don't see a conflict anymore. I would have a couple of years ago when I was a hippie. Everybody's got phones, phones, phones. 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 My name is Katie Masoris, and I'm a senior security strategist for Microsoft. Our programs are pretty new. We've been running ours for about three weeks now. It would be interesting to see if people actually start coming to us and making a living from our bounty programs. The three bounties that we're offering are the Mitigation Bypass Bounty, and that's up to $100,000 for a brand new exploitation technique. If we can learn about these techniques and, and kind of learn about the holes in the shield, we can protect against entire classes of vulnerabilities, which is why the payment is so high. That's an ongoing program, and it's not tied to any contest or special event, though we will be offering some live judging at the Black Hat Conference at the Microsoft booth around noon every day. The second program is called the Blue Hat Bonus for Defense, and that is up to $50,000 for a defensive idea. So the idea is if you find a new way to bypass our platform-wide defenses, if you can find a way to block that attack, we'll give you an extra $50,000. And then the third program is the first 30 days of the IE11 preview period. We are offering uh, up to $11,000 for vulnerabilities in IE11 preview. These are the first programs um, in Microsoft's history to offer direct cash payments in exchange for vulnerability information and information about exploitation techniques. As early as we can learn about what we call these holes in the shield, the better for us and our customers. We were basically trying to increase the win-win between the security researcher community and Microsoft's customers. That's actually my whole job at Microsoft, is working with the hacker community. And I you know, sort of grew up in this community myself and uh, you know, learned uh, from some of the, the great minds in the Boston area. I grew up around some of the folks that were in the loft and uh, I worked as, as a pen tester with At Stake, which was founded by the loft. So the hacker community can be pretty diverse and um, pretty interesting. We're really looking for people who can bring that new threat horizon to the attention of the developers and executives here at Microsoft. As a previous security researcher and penetration tester myself before I joined Microsoft, um, all the way to, to now the past six years where I've been with Microsoft, it's been really interesting to watch the evolution take place from you know, the trustworthy computing memo that Bill Gates wrote and that really put the impetus on the company to take security seriously. And you know the evolution of all of these outreach programs beginning in 2005 with the first um, researcher appreciation party that Microsoft threw at Black Hat. I think the hacker community really wants to do the right thing for the most part. They want to improve the security of, of the programs that we use every day. And that's why you know, they tend to look for vulnerabilities in them. It's kind of what they do. And uh, those who are interested in helping secure the products, they can come to us for the bounties at this point. Well, I don't know about you, Terrence, but I sure feel more secure. Me too. This episode is like a security blanket. It'll feel all warm and fuzzy inside. Uh, speaking of warm and fuzzy things, got a lot of people we need to thank. The Electronic Frontier Foundation, Cory Doctorow, Bruce Schneier. Not to mention Microsoft, Ubisoft, and The New Yorker. Yeah. Um, oh, and of course, John McAfee for easily one of the weirdest things I've ever experienced in my entire life. Oh, and speaking of weird people named John, uh, as per usual, John Roderick. He's a strange and lovely man. And. On the note of lovely man, thanks to Tim Stevens. Yep, thanks for guiding us for a couple of years now. Sure. Thanks to you, Terrence, for filling in those giant shoes he has. You're welcome. Well. Size 24. <laughs> it's freakish, really. Uh, thanks to you guys for joining us. We'll be back uh, very soon. And uh, in the meantime, we've got a train to catch. Yes, yes, we do. Separate trains. <laughs> <laughs>